Hello, everyone. I'm Cindy Runger, president of Seattle Rotary, and I'm happy to welcome you to our meeting today. So for those of you who are new to Rotary, there are 1.2 million of us around the world dedicated to a life of leadership and service, and Seattle Four is one of the largest Rotary clubs in the world, and it's the place where you can hear world-class speakers make an impact locally and globally, and also just meet a great network of community and business leaders. So today, we have a fascinating program on immersive technology. Did you know that Rotary is also harvesting the immersive power of virtual reality? So with your smartphone and a VR viewer, you can download the app. Um, can we have it on screen? There it is, on screen right there. Um, and you can immerse yourself in some of the causes that Rotary is really champions, um, like polio eradication and also peace building. So you can learn about how you can take action to make impact on the world. All right, and now for our main program. Jesse Irwin is our moderator today, and as Chief Strategy Officer, Jesse leads external strategy for IME Law's Augmented, Mixed, and Virtual Reality Practice Group, which represents clients that are defining immersive solutions for entertainment and enterprise across the globe. Outside of the firm, Jesse is involved in all sorts of cool stuff with AR, MR, and VR. In fact, she was recently an executive producer of Tree VR, an award-winning VR experience focused on conservation. So Tree VR premiered last year at the Sundance and Cannes Film Festivals, and this is me experiencing Tree VR last year. I became that tree, and this was pretty phenomenal because I remember smelling the scent of dirt and the wind in my hair and being frightened when the forest was, you know, uh, was burning down. So that was a memorable experience. Um, <clears throat> so Rotarians, why don't we give Jesse a nice warm welcome? Thank you, Cindy, so much. And panelists, if you'll join us, um, good afternoon. Thrilled to be here and to share this uh, incredible panel that we have here for you today of leaders who are really paving the way in integrating XR technology into enterprise and shaping the future of the workplace. Um, quick show of hands, how many in the room have experienced augmented, mixed, or virtual reality? The majority. Lots have changed the last 12 months. That's great, <laughs> great to see. Um, so, Quick refresher, uh, VR, which stands for virtual reality, uh, allows the user to put on a headset, enter a completely immersive environment separate from the real world. It's an environment where your senses uh, perceive uh, to be just as real as the real world, but a completely different space. Um, augmented reality functions as a digital overlay on top of the physical world, so it supplements the uh, physical world with additional layers of information. And mixed reality, which we'll hear about today as well, um, blends both the digital and physical worlds. So it allows you to literally have one hand in the digital world, one hand in the physical world, and be simultaneously interacting with both at the same time. So with uh, that context, uh, panelists, if you can please introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit more about your company and your work. Darcy, let's start with you. Great. Hello, I'm Darcy Salzman. Um, I've worked for the last five years on the Microsoft HoloLens program. For those of you that don't know what the HoloLens is, I brought one. It's a head-mounted computer that uh, allows you to mix physical and digital information together uh, and see things in 3D, what we call volumetric. Um, and I'd be pleased to be here on the panel, pleased to work with you again. Great. And did we have a trailer to roll? Oh, do you? That's awesome. I think we do. This will give a, some visual context for the HoloLens. Great.
That about sums it up. <laughs> that concludes the panel. <laughs> Adam. Hi, folks. My name's Adam Shepard. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Eight Ninths, um, and more recently, actually in the last uh, week, we announced our acquisition by Valence Group, um, a digital transformation company focused on AR and VR, but also a lot of other ancillary technologies that are emerging and transforming the way we do business today. Um, originally from the UK, been here 22 years and used to work at Microsoft, but this is a, a space that I'm extremely passionate about. I think it is going to be a transformative way in which this is going to touch all of us in the same way cell phones touched all of us. And my company specifically works with large businesses, uh, both large and small in some cases, to help them understand how to take advantage of these new capabilities that these, uh, these headsets are providing. Matt. Oh, I don't know the video. Check, check. Okay. Hey everyone, thank you uh, very much for inviting us to speak here today. It's a pretty wonderful event. Uh, and I've actually decided I'm going to start every meeting that I have now with a banjo. So <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> that was really, really that, if I could borrow that after, that'd be great. Thanks. <laughs> that was amazing. Uh, anyway, hey everyone, my name is Matt Chacon. I am uh, the CEO and co-founder of the virtual reality company Doghead Simulations. And uh, our company uses virtual reality or VR uh, to do two things, to fundamentally improve the way that people educate and collaborate. And our software product is named Roomy. Uh, it's supposed to be an adjective eventually. It's, you know, you can just say, why me, when you can room me. That's where that came from. So um, in any case, uh, you know, we're, our tool is already in use by enterprise companies and educational institutions and governments all over the world. And they use us primarily to do instructor-led distributed education for like online degree programs, to uh, corporate training, uh, and governments use us to do town halls, uh, meetings like this. So um, we're two years old and we have monthly recurring revenue, which is nice <laughs> already. Um, uh, and you know, we've got 14 people that we employ uh, all throughout North America, uh, Latin America and Europe, and we don't have a physical office. We actually meet and work every single day in virtual reality. So, thank you. And let's roll the video, please. That provides the user perspective of what it's like to be inside Rumi, your software solution in VR. It does, right, yeah. great. So clearly from what we've seen, we've entered a new era of innovation. Uh, panelists, this is for all of you. What do you see as the parallels between where we are now and uh, where we've been at previous turning points? Invention of the PC, internet, email, smartphones. What do you see as parallels? And then what do you see as unique about this moment in time with the rise of XR? Well, I would say that, um, if I can start, um, so extended reality uh, is allowing us to be more socially connected, just like the mobile phones and the internet did, which is, um, which is very interesting, but uh, it's allowing us also to replace our new paradigms of, of input devices. So you use your cell phone to control your television, to surf the web, your email, it's an input device, much like your computer was. Well, XR technologies are actually going to replace those input devices and become our new norm. Um, I would actually expect in probably the next decade for cell phones to you know, go the way of the landline. And you know, we won't be wearing clunky HMDs, head-mounted displays like this, but it will be some new iteration of uh, what's called a, a head-mounted display or an HMD. Generationally, I think I can say that there are probably only a few major eras of personal computing, and each one that follows is a democratizing wave over the one that it came before. Um, and there are some of you that uh, may be the same age as me and remember the era of the IBM PC, 
And what made the IBM PC so important to the history of computing is that what preceded the IBM PC was computing run by specialists in what used to be called the glass house. Men in three-quarter length white coats who would take your computing job and do it for you and return it to you. The IBM PC made it possible for any of us to spend what at that time was probably close to $10,000 and you could have a really lousy calculator on your desk. Um, <laughs> The next wave that I think you could argue happened is when that was still a specialist device. You had to learn to speak the language of the computer to be able to use the computer. The metaphor of the graphical user interface, the GUI interface, was it took things that we already knew how to use, a desk, a trash bin, a filing cabinet, and it put that over top of a computer's operating system. And suddenly people who weren't computer scientists, who weren't IT people, could start to use the computer for productivity tasks. I need to balance something on a spreadsheet. I need to write a document and I don't want to do it on a typewriter with whiteout. So the next wave is, this, is the GUI. I think you can, you can look at a bunch of different things after that, but I would fundamentally point to uh, the stylus and the pen as the next wave. And so those of you that remember the Palm Pilot all the way from the Palm Pilot to the, to the iPhone, we took something that humans understand how to do, which is write and point, and we said, boy, it's a lot more intuitive to touch the screen directly or to point at it with a pen than it is to grab this mouse and move it there. And suddenly, people who were used to typing in things could now write as they wrote in their notebooks on their computers. Uh, when touch screens came out, I was working for Nokia and we were one of the first people that were, or the first companies that were making phones that had touch screens. So my children grew up in a world in which the phones I brought home, the engineering phones I brought home were all touch. And they were very young at the time, and uh, it probably doesn't happen now, but I can tell you that the television in our house had fingerprints all over it. Because young children <laughs> didn't understand, once you gave them this device that they could touch, why the whole world wasn't touched, because they expected it. It was so intuitive. When the iPhone and the iPad came out, it was probably the first time your grandmother or your great-grandmother got a computer, because it was suddenly intuitive to do the New York Times crosswords puzzle because you had this essentially mini computer, and I mean mini computer in the sense of the ones that used to cost several hundred thousand dollars in your pocket. Um, I'm a big fan of Amazon's Alexa technology. I don't know if there's anybody in the room from Amazon, but hey, props, that's an amazing device. And it is the next wave. Voice is the next wave in terms of democratizing how we engage with a computer, how we ask a computer for help, and how it responds to us and gives us that help. Um, voice is something that you see as the top of the agenda of all the computer companies. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Apple, all of us are working on making it easy and intuitive to talk to a computer to get information and to have the computer talk back to you. One of the last bounding boxes of a computer is the screen. We go to a computer, whether we fish it out of our bag and open it, or whether we go to a desk and sit down. We go to a computer to do our computing, even if the majority of the work that we do is not you know, at the computer. The majority of the work is I'm in the factory, or I'm working on the loading dock, or I'm working in a hospital operating theater. Our computing hasn't really merged yet with the work that we do in the places that we do work. Um, what I could tell you today is that the type of devices that Microsoft is building, and there's certainly lots of folks chasing the same goal, is it allows you to take your computing capability to the places that you work. And because it is mounted on your head, it allows you to keep your head up, work on the tasks that you're working, supported by a computer when you need it, but heads up and hands free. And so a lot of this technology is about we already know how to talk, we know how to gesture, all of this technology has come in and democratized it. Now we're gonna take the computer to the places where we learn, where we do work. And so when I think about eras, this era is important. And uh, I, I've often told people that it'll be hard to do the next job after this because somebody's gonna say, hey, would you like to work on the ribbon in Outlook and you could work on the file close dialogue? Uh, and the answer is, it's like I probably need to go buy a paint store because I don't know what could eclipse this. This, was, this is a moment of sea change in computing, and it is awesome to be here, and it is awesome to work with guys like Adam and Matt who are taking the platforms that engineers like I get to build 
and they are making them real for people. They are building things on top of them to teach people how to do things when they can no longer, when they can't get to a classroom. In fact, one of the, if I have one more second, I'll give sure. an anecdote. I talked to a, a, a doctor who was the head of neurosurgery at David Geffen in LA, and he said, I have surgeons, brain surgeons, who come from all over the world and train with me, and they're here for four or five months, and then they go back. And he said, the biggest challenge I have is that the patient outcomes don't fundamentally change in their countries because when I'm not looking over their shoulder, they don't have the same confidence to do the surgery. And he came very early in the program and said, could I use this so that I could be present with a brain surgeon in Ghana without having to leave LA so that I can give that surgeon the confidence to do that surgery and fundamentally change the outcome of a patient in his or her country. That's what the promise of this technology is. It will allow us to do things that haven't been possible before, and as a result, we will change the way people are learning for the better, the way people get healthcare delivery for the better, um, the way we work for the better. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Darcy. It's really helpful to um, you know hear some of those tangible tangible examples of how uh, industries are adapting these technologies, and I think that's reflected in you know um, uh, Forbes at this time last year uh, said that you know 150 U.S. companies have already uh, integrated XR technology into their business operations. 52 of Fortune 500 companies are looking to test and deploy XR technology. Um, particularly as it relates to training, to corporate and employee training. So I touched on that a bit with the, the HoloLens. Um, Matt, moving from mixed reality to virtual reality, you've told us a bit, but, but really, you know, what you're doing in VR with Rumi is uh, transforming communication and collaboration in diverse environments, particularly in education. Can you share a little bit more about that impact? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks for asking. <laughs> Good question. Um, so specifically in education, um, you know, how we've impacted in education and the workplace, I'll, I want to talk about that as well, but is in a few different ways. One of them is already people no longer go to work in school. They simply attend work in school by slipping on an HMD. Uh, we don't have a physical office. I employ 14 people around the world, and we use VR. Uh, PBS just filmed a documentary on my company. Uh, I think it's going to be released in September, maybe. I don't know. We'll find out October. Um, showing how uh, there's a school in Nashville, Tennessee, that uses Rumi to bring education to the people of Pemba in Tanzania. And what's, what's interesting about that, and it's very important to us, is the action and the impact of, of that activity. So the people of Pemba in Tanzania, I mean, their education stopped at primary school, and they, they had no access to education. Now, because of our business, you know, our technology, these people are actually able to attend high school. And in the not too distant future, meaning like probably the next 18 months, they'll be attending college, which is incredible. And I, I like that. It, it resonates very well with our culture of our company because education is very important to us. And you know, it's a, one thing you can do to improve your own station in life, but also the world at large. Um, but as well, you know, from a um, you know, on the in, in enterprise um, impact, you know, uh, actually enterprise and governments um, were able to. You know, our customers are telling us that they're able to reduce their travel budgets by around eighty percent, which is nice. And a nice benefit of doing that, no longer traveling for all of these meetings, they simply do them in in VR. Uh, not everything. It's not a solution for the face-to-face. -face. There's not a replacement for the face-to-face -face meetings, but they're, they're seeing dramatic um, reductions in cost uh, by meeting in VR. But a nice benefit of that is that they are also able to reduce their carbon footprint. And we're seeing an average uh, reduction in carbon footprint by about five metric tons every week from our um, education and our corporate customers. Um, so that's actually been, been really wonderful. Um, but let me actually touch on one more thing, if I can, regarding education. Um, another interesting um, report coming from our customers who we're very engaged with is they're able to reduce the traditional lecture homework quiz exam cycle from about 75 hours to as low as eight total hours of meaningful instructor-student time. Um, and that is not a marketing slogan coming from us. That is direct input from our customers. 
Um, and the, the University of British Columbia, who's one of our customers, uh, recently published six videos online where I just found these randomly doing a Google search on my company's name, which I do a lot. <laughs> I didn't even know that they published these, but they um, uh, had their students make videos talking honestly about the benefits and um, you know the distractions of VR. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to see the students say, look, uh, when I'm taking an online degree program, I'm not engaged. I do a forum post. I um, you know, introduce myself online, and that's it. I don't even know who I'm going to school with. But by using Rumi and VR, they're much more engaged with their students. They've actually gotten rid of forum posts altogether for their online, so with this on specific online degree program, and they have interactions, mm -hmm. which is amazing. It's just a watershed moment in our history. Um, they're having interactions with people from all over the world who they wouldn't have otherwise. And because they're shielded, as you saw in our video, by an avatar, it actually gives them a mask, and it's been making them much more engaged, where a lot of these people are introverts and they wouldn't be engaged in real life. So that's a really nice benefit to see. Great. Well, and uh, I think the, the common theme here is talking about democratizing experiences, opening up access, right? And, and that's only going to continue to be fueled as more and more people adopt the technology. And so, you know, speaking of adoption, Adam, I know that uh, you work in all of these uh, different technologies, including mobile AR. Um, you know, TechCrunch just came out with their latest numbers that they anticipate a billion mobile AR users by the end of this year. So a billion people who will be able to experience augmented reality through their phone and 3.5 billion people by 2022, which back to the point of a massive sea change. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how mobile AR is shifting or shaping the work that you're doing for enterprise clients? Yeah, it's, it's been a, a, a very interesting 12 months. We, we've been involved with AR and VR for about four years now, which is in dog years, like 40 years, I think, in this space. Um, but mobile AR really had its watershed moment with the launch of a, a, a gaming application called Pokemon Go. Some of you may have, have had your kids or grandkids drag you around the streets chasing augmented reality monsters that are out, out there. Um, but this, this is a, 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 an important moment because it was the first time many people even started to consider that augmented reality could be part of their lives and started them thinking about how it could also translate into business uses, which to your, your earlier question is very similar to what we saw with the, the early days of the mobile revolution. People got an iPhone or a smartphone and then they started to think about, well, if I can, if I can check my... Uh, ferry timetable or bus timetable, why can't I check the sales performance of my organization or uh, other aspects of, around their specific line of business? So I think what we're going to see is a, a lot of adoption of augmented reality through the devices that many of you already have in your pockets. Um, as, as you said, they're predicting about a billion capable devices. Folks like Google and Apple are very aggressively pushing the, these kind of new applications forward. And examples might include everything from uh, being, uh, being beside a restaurant and very quickly being able to recognize that restaurant and provide information about, say, the menu or the opening hours, uh, being at an event like this and potentially uh, being able to see individuals' names floating above their heads, uh, <laughs> uh, walking through an airport, getting you to your gate on time, uh, letting you know, laying a kind of a path down through the the, the airport, all of these are scenarios that are, are really starting to emerge and pop. Um, we've been working with marketers in many cases to do product recognition of say a cereal packet or a, um, whatever it might be and then start to bring that content and that customer engagement to life. Uh, you might have seen examples where you look at a wine label and then the story of the winemaker is told from the, the figure who's on the, the front of the, the wine bottle. Um, looking at a mural and working with artists to animate those murals and, and tell a different story than just static art. So uh, mobile AR is going to be uh, really one of the things that I think is going to drive a lot more adoption of, of different ways in which this technology will be utilized. Great, thanks. 
and I, uh, you know, just today they came out with, uh, it looks like we're on track for uh, ARVR spending on goods and services to reach 28 billion before the end of the year. So some of these examples you're giving, you know, these are happening in very high volume all across the world in terms of trans uh, transforming how we communicate, how we market, how we train. Uh, employees for enterprise. Um, Michael Abrash, who's the chief scientist for Oculus, actually over, over in Redmond, uh, predicts that um, these technologies, the distinction between AR, VR, and mixed reality will eventually fade away, and that the future of our lives and the future of the workplace is that we'll seamlessly go through the day and mix and match these technologies as needed based on the task. Um, do you agree with this vision of the future of the workplace? Agree or disagree? I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I wouldn't have sold my last company and started this one if I didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> um, yeah, I'm betting that it's going to be, you know, I, I will say this. Uh, XR is already a very real and normal part of our daily lives. But the interesting thing is that it, we're, we carry these things around with us everywhere we go. I'm sure a lot of people in this room, pretty much everybody in this room probably does the same thing. So whether or not we even realize it, we are already craving the integration of the digital world with the physical world around us, you know, and you know, tools like the HoloLens are already making that a reality. The Magic Leap One HMD is already a reality. The Magic Leap One HMD, it's a head-mounted display. It's basically a clunky pair of glasses, but it's just a matter of time before they're not clunky anymore. Right. Um, and we're, we're, our industry is following something, you can almost set your watch by it, called Moore's Law, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, where you know, there's a dramatic technological improvement about every 18 months. And we're seeing that. In fact, uh, this is $200. About 18 months ago, it was well over $3,000. So it's, and, and it's small. I don't have to set up lighthouses, which look like these things anymore. I just throw this on. I travel all over the world with this. Um, and, you know, these technologies, AR, VR, MR, um, more colloquially known in our circles as uh, XR, extended reality, you know, they're leveraging our very natural desires for socializing, interaction, uh, learning, self-achievement. Um, and, you know, that's something that's been missing with the screens, with the, you know, the advent of the computer. It actually, we took a step away from that for a while, and now we're coming back to that, and we're having more engaging interactions, which is really wonderful. Um, and I, I'll say this, you know, I'm the CEO of a startup, so I'm gonna constantly plug my company. <laughs> so, you know, our, our company, our product, Rumi, uh, it's actually, we didn't plan for this to happen, but it kind of happened over time, and it was really interesting to see this. It has become our first experience in my company when we wake up among our employees, you know, where we work on any device. You don't actually have to wear an HMD to use our software. We work on any computer built in the last four years, you know, mobile phones, I mean, you name it, we, we run on it. So it's our, it's our first experience when we wake up. It's our primary experience throughout the day, and it's actually the final experience that we have before we go to bed. So what, what was interesting there, speaking of watershed moments, is it transitioned in the last probably year, we're a two-year-old company, from being a product to being a lifestyle. And we're hearing the exact same thing from our customers. So, and it was a really positive unintended consequence. Uh, Michael Abrash is a, a, a fantastic computer scientist who's, who's really, um, really at the forefront of this, of this era. And listen to, listening to him talk, they're really thinking about a 30-year mission uh, around not just replicating visual senses, but auditory, taste, smell, uh, uh, taste actually being the hardest. He thinks that they'll, they'll get to maybe 30 years or so from now. But um, this, this notion of really not being able to distinguish from reality and virtual reality is obviously of tremendous uh, debate. and. Uh, uh, you know, even if we technically have the capability, it obviously opens up so many different um, questions from a societal point of view. Um, I think we might see it in our lifetime or something pretty pretty close to our perception of reality. Um, it, I think it, in the current era, political environment we're living in, it, it does start to bring up questions about um, truth and also access to, to a perception of reality. If I have a, a headset or a set of equipment that changes my perception of reality, but somebody from different economic means doesn't, then what is the truth between those two worlds? 
Uh, so we're definitely entering an interesting era of, of the blending of, of the physical and the virtual world and digital world. Um, and I think it's really up to us as leaders in, the, in, the, in this industry to try and navigate this and also raise the issues as they come up. I think a lot of us take that, that responsibility very seriously. And uh, you know, we're not, not trying to pretend everything is a utopia here. With every new technology, there's always uh, pros and cons. And I think um, as a society, we need to kind of confront those head on and, and make sure that we're doing a, a good job to sh uh, shepherd this technology through. So the question was, if I paraphrase back, was, you know, do, we, do I see the, this technology becoming ubiquitous over time? Is that sort of the accurate? Sure. OK. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think the answer is yes. Because if you think about how we have used computing, in, in the beginning, it was a destination. I, I got home, maybe I turned my computer on, I did some work on it, I turned it off, some, I did something else. Today, we go throughout our day using our phone, an Alexa, the game console, the PC at work. I write some email to my mom afterwards. You pick the right tool for the right job at the right time. And, and in all of our lives, new tools show up, and they either find a place in our world, or they're relatively quickly rejected. And you can kind of make that analogy to when you started to learn how to cook. And for me, that was in university. And I had two knives. And I, I mean, the meals were good. At least they were good enough. And then somebody gave you a knife block, and you're like, oh my god, I don't have to cut bread with a knife that wasn't designed for bread. And suddenly, the tools expand what you can do, but they're also fit to purpose. And I think what you'll find is that there isn't, as it says in The Hobbit, one ring to rule them all. Um, there's the right tool at the right moment for the right job. Having worked on this for four years and seen what people can do with it, and we build the device and the platform, and we sort of... Uh, light the fire, if you will. Um, but the magic comes when people bring their ideas and the problems they want to solve, and they say, hey, can I do this with your device? And we sit down and we think, maybe. We didn't design it for that, but let's go figure out if it'll work. And increasingly, you see people come back and they say, I did this with your device. I didn't even talk to you about it. I just did this thing. What do you think? My hunch is that this spectrum of technologies is within, as you said, almost 18 months from now, I would guess that it has become far more ubiquitous than any of us would imagine. Much in the same way that when Amazon announced the Alexa, which maybe three years ago, it went from nothing to a business that is shipping tens of millions of units every quarter. And we don't think it's weird anymore to talk to a beer can sitting on the kitchen counter. <laughs> So, or a hockey puck as they're now coming, $29 on Black Friday, kudos to those hardware engineers. Um, that adoption happened because it was natural and intuitive and valuable. And I think you will see the same curve here because as people start to use it, they're like, it's discovering another sense. It's like, oh my God, I didn't realize I could do that. And then they start applying it to the problems that they have that they want to solve. Great. I think we're, we're almost out of time here, so in 30 seconds or less, uh, if we could leave the leaders in the room with one thought about the impact of immersive technology on enterprise um, and what they can do to take action. Sure, I'll start, so 30 seconds, go. <laughs> so um, I would say if you leave here today with one thought in your head, one word, uh, I would like that word to be unification. XR is unifying the world in ways we've really never seen before, and it's quite fascinating. And it's bridging social class. It's closing the resource gap. Uh, it's freeing our own very distinct human capabilities to simulate, to visualize, to interact, uh, again, in ways we've never seen before. So I would actually hope that people leave this room with one word of unification. Great. Um, I, w I think given that we're living through so much disruption currently, we're going to find a lot of people will need to be very flexible in their, their working habits, their, uh, their careers, and one of the most, the, the best use cases of this technology today is around training and education and being able to very rapidly not have to read through boring textbooks and abstract tomes and try and make that translation between um, the hands-on job and the actual uh, uh, the, 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 the educational aspect of it. I think what you're going to see are people are going to be using this medium in, in, in many different jobs 
to retool, to re-gear re themselves for the new opportunities ahead. And I think that's a really positive thing, um, and it's a, a really great kind of fit for the technology in its current state of evolution. So I would encourage you to think about the way in which you, you train or educate and think about how these tools might be uh, applied in those use cases. So I think one of the biggest challenges that many of us have when we're working, and especially that entrepreneurs have when they're building a business, is that they work in their business and they don't work on their business because the working in their business takes uh, all the available hours in the day. And usually when I start a conversation with a company about HoloLens, I say, tell me about the three biggest problems you want to solve in the next two years. Is it figuring out how to grow your sales force? Is it figuring out how to reduce the cost of this particular manufacturing? Think about the difficult, perhaps the intractable problems in your business. And then go have a conversation with somebody that you know that knows something about this technology and say, is there an application for this? Because I'm trying to figure out how I train my salespeople in less than three months given that I have high turnover in my sales force and it's expensive for me to train people. I'm trying to figure out how to compress the cycle with which we do prototypes because we do hundreds of thousands of dollars of mock-ups, uh, uh, physical mock-ups, before we figure out how to build a product. So go figure out what is the, the, the challenge, the vexing challenge in your business, and then have a conversation with somebody uh, who's a little bit more familiar about this technology and said, is there an application here? Could I do something with it? Because the real benefit of this technology and what is going to change it taking off is if it drives economic biz value to the companies that are using it. You shouldn't be building postcards or little marketing instantiations initially. You should figure out what the business drivers are that change the economics of your business, and that's where you go to apply it first. Great. Thank you so much. And do we have time for one or two questions here? Two questions. All right. We have a question from our member, Jeff Borick. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for being here today. Uh, you touched upon early in the opening statements the democratization of this technology and technology over time from the era of the mainframe Unix to uh, the desktop and mobile. Uh, that was a great positive shift, but the other shift that seems to be happening is back towards proprietary platforms. The Apple platform is locked down, Google controls the Android platform. How is VR or XR going to be open, and to what degree does open source fit into that model? I'll take a you quick, take the first pass. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's a great observation, and with any any kind of closed platforms, there's both pros and cons to it. You know, some of the pros are you don't have to try and boil the ocean and, and fit every single device and all the different, it can really slow down the pace of innovation. The flip side is, um, you know, you're locked in with that device and, and maybe there's uh, suspect kind of economic models around it. Um, I think what you'll see is, is hopefully in the same way um, the internet kind of moved beyond a little bit of these uh, things like AOL and MSN, some of these walled gardens. And, and I think what will happen is the development community will look for ways to create these unified experiences that, that are, are able to reach audiences no matter what the device is. So I'm optimistic that um, uh, while we may see in the, in the early years some walled gardens, that you're going to see a little bit more of a, a, a unifying and open approach. And some of that's going to be enabled through technologies like blockchain, which is another fascinating area that where somebody's able to essentially um, track how their content, if I scan a beautiful statue I've created and make that available, I'm able to receive attribution every time, say, somebody puts it in their virtual museum. So things like that, I think, are gonna enable a more fair approach to um, how these technologies are being deployed. I think it's worth, again, having a conversation about the, the kind of the costs and how we make money. Um, for most of the companies that are in this space, uh, this is a nine-figure investment. Most of my, uh, I have friends who work on all the competitive platforms. There isn't a viable development team out there that's less than a thousand people. Um, most of the people that you're hiring are very smart and, and it's not inexpensive talent. Um, there's a conversation about how, how, do, how do companies make money and it's useful to figure that out. If you don't pay for the service, then you are the product, right? It's free to search the internet, but what Google is selling is our eyeballs to advertisement. So you always gotta look at the economic model about how the technology is being created and then figure it out. There certainly is 
the likelihood that the, en the engineers who are building on top of this will look for ways to continue to abstract the platforms from the value that they create so that that's portable, so that they have bets in multiple camps. But fundamentally, every one of us that is building this is into billion dollar investments. And so we have an obligation to you as our shareholders to turn those investments into returns to fund your child's education and your retirement. So yeah. we're, we're trying to figure that out uh, at the same time while we make sure that in the long term, our goal as a company is to make these things ubiquitous. We want to make them inexpensive because when they are ubiquitous, it builds opportunities for you guys to build businesses on top of them. Yeah, and let me just add one quick thing to that. Uh, I would say both of those statements were very well put, well said. But, um, you know, it's, speaking of uh, getting out of the walled gardens, there's the internet. You know, you're going to see probably in the next two years web VR, web AR, web MR. So um, we're not going to be, we're no longer going, going to be constrained to these devices. It, there's going to be an, an interface with the web, web browsers in some, some fashion. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for having us here today. Thank you to our panelists uh, for being here with us. So, and finally, to close with a, mod, a nod to our moderator's ancestral roots, whose family comes from Norway and Sweden, and some were homesteaders, um, just as they were committed to pioneering for the promise of the future, Jesse Irwin is pioneering the future of immersive technology. And so their Norwegian proverb is, only one who wanders finds new paths. Thanks, everybody. This has been fun. We are adjourned. <laughs>